Hey guys, welcome back to the Blue Deck Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Mazarak. Before we dive back into the story, just a quick reminder, we are having a giveaway. Reviews are super important to new podcasts, so in episode 7, we will be giving away a free deck of the Blue Deck branded playing cards to one of our iTunes reviewers. One star, five star, that doesn't matter. It's just our way of saying thank you for being involved and helping to support the channel. Subscribe if you haven't already. It's totally free, and that way you won't miss an episode. Also, you can follow me on social media, Joseph Mazrak on Twitter. That's J-O-S-E-P-H-M-A-Z-E-R-A-C. Where do you think the story's going? Do you have a favorite scene, or was there a line of dialogue you really loved? Anything like that, I'd like to hear about. And I really do want encouragement. In some ways, my creative bugs are as resilient as roaches, but in other ways, they're quite fragile. So if you shoot me a message saying you like what we're doing here, that will give me a nice warm inner glow for a little while. One last thing, if you'd rather listen to this story on YouTube, you can do that. Just go to YouTube and search The Blue Deck. That will pull up our channel. If you've made it here to chapter four, I take it you like what you're hearing. Well, you're in for a real treat because this is one of my favorite episodes. Now, here's a quick recap of chapter three. In the morning, joined by Charles's best friend, William, the kids return to the lakeside in hopes to find Captain Kidd. They are not completely disappointed. They do not find the captain, but find his raft tied along the bank. An attempt is made to pull the raft ashore, but the thing will not budge a single inch, even though it's floating and has no anchor. Undaunted, Dawn kicks off her sandals and goes out into the water to investigate. The others join her, and when they climb up, soaking wet onto the raft, they find that not only will it not move toward the shore, but it won't move at all. Even with the four of them standing on the little raft, their combined weight doesn't rock the boat. Not one bit. That is when Dawn points with her toe, directing the boys' attention to the floor planks. In the floor, narrow grooves form a rectangle. Their youthful detective minds identify the purpose at once. The raft has a secret compartment. Then Charles remembers something Dawn said when they were still on the bank. When he'd pointed out the lack of human footprints in the muck along the shoreline, an idea that suggests the captain hadn't come ashore, Don looked out at the immovable raft and muttered, He's hiding on it someplace. Hiding on the raft? That seemed impossible. But now, impossible or not, Charles thought she was right. And now, into the Attic of the World, Chapter 4, Door in the Floor. In spite of the few refinements, the brass mounting bracket and a bundle of black square head nails, the raft was clearly not commercially made. It was, as the boy had claimed, made of logs, and the ones forming the perimeter were notched, fitted together, and secured with ropes. The raft sat low in the water, mere inches above the surface. With the four of us on it, it should have rocked and swayed terribly, but it didn't. It felt as securely fixed as any pier I'd walked on. A part of me wondered if it was the same raft we'd seen before. For that matter, was it a raft at all? Maybe it was something different. Whatever it was, it was small. If I had laid down, I likely could have touched all four sides at once with some part of my body. I took a knee and felt at the rectangle on the floor. Perhaps if I had a knife, like the one the boy captain wore in his belt, I could have used it to pry the thing open, if it opened at all. But I had no knife, and my fingernails weren't strong enough. Ozzie leaned over me. What's this? He pushed a circular knot in the wood. It sank into the plank, popping up again with a click as he released it. The knot was some kind of handle. We all looked at each other. 
my friends' faces, mixing with varied levels of trepidation and curiosity, all urged me forward to go ahead and open the secret door. I looked down at the raised wooden knot. The vertical surface had a smooth groove carved around it for gripping. I touched it cautiously. What if it was a trap? Slowly, I pulled the knot, and the door tilted open on hidden hinges. It creaked, and my arms stiffened, but I kept going. As the door eased open, the sunlight streaming in did not reveal a simple compartment for stowing trinkets, but an entire lower cabin, and a large one at that. Captain Kidd reclined below us in a hammock strung neatly between a pair of bookcases. He squinted against the inrushing sunlight. Shading his eyes with a hand, he leaned over and trimmed out the flame on a red lantern hanging from a hook on the wall. The walls of the cabin were logs, like a log cabin out in the woods. It was impossible to think that such a large room, especially a wooden one, existed beneath the waterline below the tiny raft floor. I looked from the open door, past the edge of the raft, and saw nothing below us in the water but murky brown vegetation and blue-green tinted sand. No cabin at all, unless it was invisible from the outside. William was leaning over the edge of the raft. I could tell by the expression on his face that he saw nothing beneath us either. It's cloaked, he said, like a Klingon bird of prey. He was referring to the enemy warships on Star Trek, and of course he was exactly right. Then I heard Don's breath catch in her chest. When I looked up, both she and Ozzie were frozen in place. Don's hand stiffly reached for my arm, and she stepped back I had to catch her from falling backwards into the water. William went for the hole in the floor, lifting his glasses onto his forehead. When he looked into the shadowy space, his eyes widened, his face hardening. That was his fighting face. I glanced at Don. She was clinging to me. Then as boldly as I dared, I looked into the impossible space beneath us. At first, I saw only what I noticed before. The boy in his hammock, the bookshelves, the red lantern on the wall. But as my eyes adjusted to the dimness, I could see farther into the dark corners. There in the shadows, sitting in a rocking chair, was a man. A broad-brimmed cowboy hat hit his face, but I could faintly make out the rough silver of his beard. He wore a black duster, dirty, scuffed, and ruffled from long use. The hard triangular tips of his boots clipped the line of sunlight at his feet like black mountain peaks. Most importantly, however, was the shape of a rifle propped across his lap. Even with the gentle morning breeze blowing across the lake, I could smell the oiled steel. The man was the most menacing creature I had ever laid eyes on, as hard as a boxer's fist and twice as mean. I knew at once, there sat the reason the kid's patch fairy stopped delivering merit badges. She'd fallen victim to that monster. He'd killed her or was holding her ransom, and now he had Captain Kidd. Us too, if we weren't careful. My eyes shot to William. He'd slipped a foot under the upturned lip of the open door. With the slightest nod from me, he'd kick it shut, and the four of us could spring into the water before the villain lifted his gun, much less fired a shot. My heart raced. Then I felt Don's arm brush against me. Her hands were balled into fists. She looked ready to, not just to fight, but to murder the no-good outlaw where he sat. What would she do? Pounce down on him like a lunatic badger, wild-eyed and nails thrashing? I had no idea, but seeing her like that gave me strength. I looked down on Captain Kidd again. The relaxation I'd observed on his face was a mistake. He was lying in a hammock, true, but his eyes were weary and blinking, his jaw muscles tense, his whole body as tight as a bowstring. He looked scared, tired, and angry in equal portions. I didn't know the young captain well, but I doubted he was often so out of sorts. With a thick voice, I asked him, You okay? I've had some bad news, he said. Bad news? Was that what he called strange gunmen? I looked to the shadowy figure, and out of the corner of my eye I could see William's leg muscles flex ready to fling the door shut. But Captain Kidd did something strange. He waved for us to climb down, as if the big bad wolf wasn't waiting there to devour us. The captain followed my eyes. I'm okay, he said. Marshal Rabin's a friend. When the cowboy tipped back his hat, 
The face I saw was not a monstrous wolf's grinning gray muzzle, but looked instead like the world's toughest grandpa. He looked like a man who'd spent twenty years in the Marine Corps and then enjoyed his retirement on beat cop duty in a crime-ridden inner city, only instead of the crisp blue uniform of a police officer, he dressed instead like a bounty hunter in a western movie. Marshal? I asked. Is that your name, or... The man folded back his duster. On his shirt, a tarnished metal star. He spoke with a voice as dry as the dust on his clothes. U.S. Marshal Service. At that, a breath rushed out of me as relief poured in. I felt like I'd been the opposite of snake bit, like poison was being sucked out of me rather than squirted in. Ozzy teetered and swayed. Oh, man, you guys were freaking me out. In an exaggerated motion, he wiped his forehead with the back of his hand. Then, bending down to take a better look at the basement dwellers, he propped his hands on the soaked legs of his shorts. You guys are really something, you know that? The cowboy looked at Captain Kidd. These are the ones you told me about? I told you they would find us. The captain scrutinized their faces. Except, who are you? He was talking to William. He's with me, I said. He's my best friend. The cowboy smiled. Let him speak for himself, son. His rust-colored eyes focused on William. Well, young man, the good captain asked you a question. I'd hear you answer. William pushed his sunglasses a little farther onto his forehead. His young face mirrored more of the man's hard menace than I thought possible. I wasn't home yesterday morning, he looked at the captain, when you were here before. Then he raked fingers through his hair, sighing, and hung his thumbs in the front pockets of his jeans. My name's William Gazick. He shot a quick nod over his shoulder. I live down the street. What is this place? Some kind of magic trick? Something like that, the young captain said. Uh-huh. William's mutter was a sound of skepticism, and I wholeheartedly agreed. The magic seemed true, but the trick did not. Something like that, the kid had said. The captain and his marshal did not feel like prankster magicians. These were no pen and teller, not at all. But the clear, empty water beneath us had to be an illusion, using mirrors or I didn't know what, but not real magic. Surely not. That would be crazy. We can come inside? Don asked. The captain nodded. I hope you will, but leave the door open. It's stuffy in here. Oz was the first down the ladder. He seemed eager to go. I followed him, only a little reluctant, because, well, I had prayed for something like this. Prayed to help the captain. Now this was happening. Don came down after me. The room was huge for a raft, which had no business having a lower cabin at all. But with the five of us inside, it felt crowded. My back was to a wall lined with fishing rods and tackle. Don standing close at my left. To my right, William was coming down the ladder. Captain Kidd sat up in his hammock, crossing his legs. He stretched out a hand toward William. I'm Captain Kidd. Welcome. They shook hands. I looked to Ozzy, who was standing between a dresser and the marshal, eyeing the long gun laid across the cowboy's lap. Down in the small room, the smell of the gun was stronger, and now I could also smell his dusty leathers. An armoire and desk occupied the space between Marshal Rabin and Don. Atop the dresser, an aquarium glowed blue, casting ghostly shimmers onto the wall. The bottom of the tank was lined with river rocks, across which scooted the reddest crab I'd ever seen. After taking in the scene, I asked, Are you going to tell us what this is about? Then Don, You said there was bad news? The little captain nodded heavily. Remember I told you the patch fairy's missing? Turns out she's been kidnapped. His eyes flicked to the marshal, then back to Dawn. I intend to rescue her. You do? Her whisper brimmed with admiration. The captain looked my direction, and whatever he hoped a glimpse in my eyes, he probably didn't see it. To me, the crime didn't seem real, not even close. For that matter, the fairy herself was still an open question. At that moment, I was more interested in trying to figure out how the cabin fit under the raft. He smiled at me warmly. What do you think of my boat? More like a submarine, I guess. He leaned back in the hammock and tapped the log wall behind him with a knuckle. Neat trick, right? Was it a trick? 
How is this possible? Don asked, her eyes dancing between wonderment and fear. The cowboy answered, It's not possible, young miss, not normally, but the good captain ain't from around here. He squinted, peering over at the kid. They don't know about the decks, do they? Not yet, the captain said. The marshal felt in his pocket. Are you going to explain it, or should I?'